Welcome to When Gen X Ruled the Multiplex, the films that shaped the MTV generation. Over the course of this series, I've taken liberties with that premise a few times by looking at films that haven't really shaped anyone, but which nonetheless I've enjoyed probably more than I should. Such is the case with today's film. 1984's Voyage of the Rock Aliens, a trashy B-movie musical comedy with no redeeming value other than being really entertaining. Voyage of the Rock Aliens was directed by James Fargo, director of The Enforcer and Every Which Way But Loose, while the script was written by S. James Guidotti and Edward Gold and Charles Hairston. Real life's open-hearted plays while a guitar-shaped ship glides through space. Inside, a spherical robot named 1359 exposits that the ship has been combing the galaxy in search of the source of rock music and has narrowed it down to a small handful of planets. Under the flimsy pretext of looking at one such planet, the film then awkwardly shoehorns in the entire music video for When the Rain Begins to Fall, a duet sung by Jermaine Jackson of the Jackson 5 and Pia Zadora. For those not in the know, actress-singer Pia Zadora was the source of much critical scorn in the early 1980s for her marriage to a wealthy and well-connected and much older man who wined and dined members of the Hollywood Foreign Press and essentially bought his wife a Golden Globe for her performance in the 1981 film Butterfly, which he had financed and which had not yet been released in theaters at the time Zadora won the award. After Butterfly was released, the critical consensus was that Zadora was absolutely terrible in it. Be that as it may, Zadora went on to have a pretty respectable career as a Grammy-nominated singer, and her performance in Voyage of the Rock Aliens is a lot of fun. We see the complete music video for When the Rain Begins to Fall, which was filmed in Italy and which was an elaborate production. It features an epic story about two rival gangs on motorbikes who wear some outstanding fashions complete with novelty sunglasses. Jermaine and Pia play star-crossed lovers from opposing gangs. The song barely made a splash in the US, but was a number one hit in much of Europe, and it is a big, cheesy, over-the-top bop. This music video has nothing to do with anything else that happens in Voyage of the Rock Aliens, but I'm so glad the filmmakers insisted on forcing it into the story anyway. Aboard the spaceship, 1359 restores the cryogenically frozen crew members, who were shrunk down to Barbie doll size and stashed in the fridge for their interstellar voyage. The revived commander of the ship is named ABCD, or as it will be pronounced throughout the film, Absid. Absid is played by Tom Nolan, whom we have seen as Judge Reinhold's awful boss in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. The rest of his crew have alphabet names as well, and they are played by the members of a Phoenix-based new wave band called Rayma. Commander Absid and his crew sing Rayma's song 21st Century while preparing for their arrival on Earth. In the town of Spielberg, at the beachfront of a toxic lake, a teen named Dee Dee complains to her best friend Diane that her bad boy boyfriend Frankie won't let her sing with his band at the upcoming high school cotillion. Dee Dee is played by Pia Zadora, and we have to take it on faith that Dee Dee is an entirely different character from the identical woman on another planet who was singing a duet with Jermaine Jackson in the opening sequence. Diane is played by Alison LaPlaca, well known in the late 80s and the 90s for her work in television, including a starring role on The John Larroquette Show. Dee Dee sings a song called Real Love and leads all of the beachgoers in a big dance number while the members of Frankie's gang slash rock band The Pack provide backup. The members of The Pack are played by the members of the Los Angeles-based rockabilly band Jimmy and the Mustangs. Frankie arrives clad in black leather and balls out the pack for performing with Dee Dee instead of with him. Frankie is played by Craig Sheffer, whom we have seen as the villain in Some Kind of Wonderful. Sheffer is generally a very serious actor. Prior to his film career, he'd done a great deal of theater work, and it's a hoot seeing him in this early comedic role. He gives what can only be described as a deeply weird and borderline unhinged performance as the glassy-eyed, tantrum-prone Frankie. Meanwhile, on the spaceship, Absid and his crew cram into a transportation device to disguised as a telephone booth and head down to Earth. While the aliens begin their search for intelligent life, the robot 1359 tags along, disguised as a fire hydrant. Why, yes, this film will include a later scene in which a dog tries to take a whiz on 1359. How did you ever guess? While ogling a buff dude through a telescope, the local sheriff spots the spaceship launching the telephone booth to Earth, which leads her to believe the town is under imminent attack from aliens. The sheriff is played by Ruth Gordon, star of Harold and Maude, and Oscar winner for Rosemary's Baby. Her deputy is played by Peter Stelzer, who was this production's on-set acting coach. This was a pretty important job. Between the band members of Rayma playing the aliens and the band members of Jimmy and the Mustangs playing the pack, the film featured a great many non-professional actors in significant roles. In a 1950s, 50s inspired diner, the pack performed the song Justine. In the ladies' room, Dee Dee complains to Diane that Frankie keeps ignoring her to spend time with the pack. 
Dee Dee belts out, you bring out the lover in me in a show-stopping song and dance number staged largely on toilets. The aliens arrive at the diner and immediately run afoul of Frankie and the pack. When Absent spots Dee Dee, he's flooded with so many hormones that his head blows clear off his shoulders. Ramos Combine Man, a peppy song about a man who drives a combine, plays while the aliens sneak back to their spaceship to put Absent back together. Having successfully restored their leader, the aliens roar up to the beach on a tractor. Impressed by their lively pop tune about farm equipment, Diane asks the aliens to play at the school cotillion. Upon learning that Dee Dee will be there, Absid agrees. Back on the spaceship, Absid builds an electronic gizmo that will make Dee Dee sexually desire him. He daydreams about singing the duet Little Bit of Heaven with her. Absid activates his gizmo in the diner. Instead of making Dee Dee horny, it inspires fervent sexual desire in every male diner patron. Everyone tries to ravish Absid, and Dee Dee comes to his rescue. Upon learning that Frankie won't let her sing with the pack, Absid offers to let Dee Dee sing with his band at the cotillion. She doesn't mean a thing to me by Mark Spiro plays while the aliens wander around town conducting experiments. Meanwhile, a serial killer named Chainsaw escapes from the State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, along with his equally murderous accomplice, The Breather, played by Wallace Merck. Chainsaw is played by the Hills Have Eyes star Michael Berryman, whom we have seen in Weird Science. Chainsaw and the Breather go on a murder spree, though the sheriff believes the aliens are responsible for all the carnage. Frankie spots Absid chatting with Dee Dee in the diner. Insane with jealousy, Frankie orders the pack to beat him up. While Jimmy and the Mustangs sing Come On, Absid uses his alien abilities to defend himself from their attack. At the cotillion, Dee Dee confesses to Diane that she's starting to fall for Absid. The pack sing Troublemaker while Chainsaw breaks into the school and attacks the sheriff's deputy. Dee Dee breaks up with Frankie, then joins Absid and the aliens on stage to sing Let's Dance Tonight. The pack retaliate with their own rockabilly-infused take on Let's Dance Tonight, and before you know it, it's a full-on battle of the bands. Dee Dee and Absid slip out of the school while the aliens perform Get Out and Dance. In the corridors of the school, Chainsaw attacks Diane, but his chainsaw breaks before he can murder her. Diane, who is a highly competent grease monkey, repairs it for him, and Chainsaw and Diane inexplicably fall in love. While out on a romantic stroll with Absid, Dee Dee explains that the lake is filled with a potent mixture of acid rain and nuclear waste. Unseen by Dee Dee and Absid, a multi-tentacled creature emerges out of the water. Absid confesses that he's an alien, then takes Dee Dee back to his spaceship and asks her to fly off with him to his home planet. Upon learning she'd have to have an operation to take away her emotions, Dee Dee reluctantly concludes their romance is doomed. Frankie disbands the pack due to his heartbreak over being dumped by Dee Dee. He dances around in the corridors of the school and sings Nature of the Beast, a song about how his innocent face hides his dark elusive eyes. He then cavorts in the wilderness with cougars and with sexy ladies dressed as wildcats, and it may be the single greatest and weirdest thing Craig Sheffer has ever done on film. Alas, Sheffer does not do his own singing. Frankie's vocals are provided by Michael Bradley, a former lead singer of Paul Revere and the Raiders. When the breather attacks Frankie in the school, Dee Dee distracts him, giving Frankie a chance to overpower him. The multi-tentacled lake creature wraps itself around the school, trapping Frankie and Dee Dee inside. At Diane's request, Chainsaw saves Dee Dee and Frankie by using his newly repaired chainsaw to hack away at the lake monster's tentacles. Dee Dee reaffirms her love for Frankie, and a heartbroken Absid witnesses them kissing. The aliens, including 1359, return to the ship, which has been trashed by the members of the pack. The rejected members of the pack try to beat Frankie up for disbanding the gang, but from within the spaceship, Absid transforms the members of the pack into harmless Boy Scouts. Dee Dee and Frankie sing When the Rain Begins to Fall in front of the world's worst green screen effects, while the aliens zip off in their guitar-shaped spaceship. Apart from a few scattered screenings, Voyage of the Rock Aliens never received a theatrical release in the US. It made it into theaters in parts of Europe due to the overseas popularity of Piazzadora's album, but the film remained largely unknown for many years. It slunk onto VHS in 1988, which is how my sister discovered it. She and I have a similar trash aesthetic, so she was enthralled by its gloriously cheesy chaos, and she introduced me to it. In recent years, late night screenings at the Alamo Drafthouse raised its profile, and it's now available to watch at home through multiple streaming services. After decades of obscurity, it's starting to gain some cult momentum, so if you haven't seen it yet, now is probably the optimal time to discover Voyage of the Rock Aliens. Back when I looked at Say Anything, I mentioned how the Wurlitzer jukebox would pop up in 80s films as a symbol of carefree good times and nostalgia for the 1950s. A Wurlitzer features prominently in the diner in Voyage of the Rock Aliens, which is entrenched in the same kind of reverent 50s nostalgia found in many 80s films, as I discussed back in my analysis of Back to the Future. The production design of Voyage of the Rock Aliens reflects the 1950s in the decor of the diner, and in the flouncy dresses worn by Dee Dee and Diane to the cotillion, and in the black leather greaser fashions worn by the members of the pack. 
in the case of Voyage of the Rock Aliens, the 50s nostalgia makes stylistic sense because the film is a love letter to the pulpy B-movies of the 1950s and 60s. Screenwriter S. James Guidotti wanted the film to capture the experience of surfing through multiple channels of late-night television, catching fragments of a B-movie about an alien invasion, and a B-movie about tough street gangs, and one about a serial killer, and one about a creature formed by toxic waste. The story in Voyage of the Rock Aliens is chaotic and often half-assed. For instance, while it's lovely seeing Ruth Gordon in one of her final roles, absolutely nothing about the sheriff's storyline ever pays off. But nonetheless, as a relic of the wild 80s, this film is outstanding. The fashions are entertainingly bizarre, Pia Zadora sings and dances up a storm, Alison LaPlaca has nothing to be ashamed of, and Craig Sheffer's performance is weirdly fascinating. The soundtrack and the musical numbers are genuinely pretty good. If you like Devo, you'll probably like Rayma. If you like the Stray Cats, you'll probably like Jimmy and the Mustangs. If you like 80s trash, guilty as charged, you will probably like this film. I've saved one of the greatest films of the 80s for my 100th and final episode. Next week I'll be looking at The Empire Strikes Back. Thank you for joining me here today, I will meet you back here one last time for that. <laughs>